review a bill and why you voted the way you did? I voted yes on the bill. Uh, I believed at the time, and I still believe, that it was a good uh, way to leverage uh, assets that we had available as a state to build buildings on uh, campuses all across the state, including here, right here in Columbia. I wish uh, it would have passed the first year we did that because that building would be nearing completion by now and uh, there'd be some wonderful things that would be happening there. So yes, I did vote for that and, and I believe it was the right thing to do at that time. Would anyone else like to respond? Mrs. Schultz. This is one vote that definitely distinguishes my opponent and I. I would have voted against that bill. There were good things that were in that bill. There were loan forgiveness programs for teachers going into unaccredited schools. There were many things in that legislation that I would have supported. However, I cannot support a bill that gives private colleges larger scholarships than public universities. And pardon me why I look at my notes so I make sure I get the dollar amounts right. But Access Missouri, first of all, bumped up need-based scholarships to families that make $225,000 a year. I don't consider that a need-based scholarship. I think we could have made a wiser investment. It gives people attending public two-year institutions $300 to $1,000. $1,000 to $2,000 per public four-year, and for private colleges, $2,000 to $4,600. I don't believe that the state of Missouri needs to be giving more money to students to go to private colleges. Higher education, public higher education, should be our top priority. Anyone else? Mrs. Stem? I would just like to add that uh, it was such a great bill. Well, I mean, the Mohila uh, group did this totally in private, in violation of all of the Sunshine uh, Laws, and they got caught in the act. And uh, when this was brought to light, then you started seeing a lot of discussion about why they were doing it and what it was all about. And what it was about was passing out political plums all around the state of Missouri to help Governor Blunt get reelected. And uh, it was not, it was putting the interest of that governor above the well-being of Missouri students. Mr. Schaefer. Thank you. I think we all need to understand what Mohila is and what Mohila isn't. Mohila is a loan consolidator. Mohila, basically, it's a middleman to encourage private entities to give loans to students, which they then sell to Mohila as a consolidator, which bundles them and then sells them on the auction market. And we are not the only state with this. Every single state has one. I, I went to law school in Vermont, and I used VSAC, which is the, the Vermont Student Loan Assistance Corporation, for the exact same thing. They exist in all states. Every one of them is in the same boat that Mohila is in right now. Because here's the thing. The assets that Mohila owns are those loans. So when Mohila can't bundle up those loans and sell them on the auction market, because the auction market dried up with, with the subprime mortgage crisis, its loans that it holds are basically worthless because it cannot sell them. And we actually are fortunate that Mohila did sell the loans that it sold before the meltdown because if it didn't, it would be sitting on that many more worthless loans right now. The other thing is the $85 million that Senator Graham lost, that was the number one project from the Mohila sale, the very first project. That $85 million was coming here first off. Mohila did pay the state $250 million right after the sale. So, had the filibuster not occurred from Senator Graham, had we not lost the money, the issue of funding would be somebody else's issue right now. It would not be the University of Missouri's. Unfortunately, it didn't go through that year. The Ellis Fischel money was on top of that. We did get that this past year, but because it got bumped down the list, then that's where we are now. Again, the issue of the student curator bill, I'm hearing Senator Graham saying that he thinks there should be a student curator, which I, again, do not oppose. I think it needs to be done correctly, but to, to allow a student a voice on the, on the Board of Curators to control tuition. But what he, one of the issues he filibustered on the Mohila sale and the $85 million was there was potentially a tuition cap, which he opposed. So again, the Mohila sale, had he been a negotiator, somebody who cooperates, brings people together, which he cannot even do in his own party. And please look into statements made by Maida Coleman in the last two weeks, the outgoing Senate Minority Leader. 
who question his ability to ever be a leader in the party because he cannot bring people together. We have got to have somebody from this district that can bring people together. Is there enough blame to go around on the Republican and Democrat side? Yes. Do we need moderation? Absolutely. Do we need people who have negotiated cases and worked together to bring people together to see common ground? Yes. And that's what I can do. It's what we don't have in the Senate now. I believe you had a, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, Senator Graham. With all due respect, Senator Coleman didn't say that. And she and I have talked about that. Um, you weren't in the arena and you don't know what's going on. Um, first of all, I mean, if you want to go back to when the original money was provided or about to be provided for the Health Sciences Center, Gene Carnahan had that as an earmark that was announced on this campus. When Jim Talent uh, won that election, he let that earmark go. So we can go back and we can rehash all that. But specifically on Senate Bill 389, both Ed Robbie and I voted against it because there were problems with that bill. One of which is the tuition cap. Number one, it's unconstitutional. If you take a look at the powers of the University of Missouri in the Constitution, which if you're elected, you swear to uphold, you have to make sure that what you pass is constitutional. And that is not constitutional to limit the powers of the University of Missouri. But they were scared to death of Matt One. And they didn't want to fight it because they were scared of him. And I don't blame them. But that was an unconstitutional piece of that bill that was opposed by ASUF. It was opposed by the university. It was opposed by the flagship council. It was universally opposed in this community. And the people in this community asked me to oppose that, and I did. And it was the right thing to do. You know, sometimes down there, people want to do things that are politically expedient. It's easy to stand up and defend academic freedom when it's convenient. It's difficult when it's hard. And it was a hard time. When you say that you can't have money for a cancer hospital unless you agree to stop certain research that may find a cure to cancer, that's a tough place to be in. And you can't always just negotiate your way out when you have people who are so set, like Missouri Right to Life and the Catholic Conference, on getting test votes in their caucus that they force these things, it's a mess. And we all knew it was gonna be a mess. We all dealt with it the best that we could. And not voted it the same way, maybe for different reasons, but I think he and I both opposed an unconstitutional tuition cap that was placed in that bill that can cause harm to this university, its ability to issue bonds, its ability to manage itself as we move forward. Thank you. Any other comments? <laughs> have about heard all I need to hear about Chuck's quote inappropriate behavior with the Mohila bill. First of all, the Mohila bill was never necessary at all. First two iterations of it were patently illegal. Patently illegal. The governor could not do what he wanted to do without the legislature legislator acting. He attempted to do it twice. Both times he rightly got slapped back. I applaud both Democrats and Republicans in the legislature for telling him to get off. What they should have done with the, uh, for the <coughs> university funding is go to a, a state building fund, a general obligation bond. We did it in my day, we did it successfully, it is cheaper, it is cleaner, and it is upfront. However, the real big issue here is what did Chuck do? And what Chuck did was a profile courage. What he did is stand alone on the floor of the Senate when politicians attempted to tell the University of Missouri researchers that could not do research on stem cells. First of all, as Chuck said, it is constitutionally um, prohibited for them to do that. And second of all, it evidences profound contempt for the role of the professors at a research institution. He stood there alone and fought for academic freedom and the right to do research at a level one research institution. Still, no one can point to a single action that Chuck did that cost the University of Missouri one dime. What happened was the governor and the Republican Party took the money out to punish him for having stood for academic freedom. 
Chuck did not do it. They did it and said it is Chuck's fault. If, in fact, you believe that a person who fights the way he did for academic freedom caused the lot loss of that money, then I say I am proud to know him. And I am proud that he served the highest principles of a level one research institution. Thank you. Okay. I have another question. Thank you. Hi, uh, greetings. Thank you all for being here. It's, it means a lot. Uh, my name is Michael Mann. I'm a member of the same Mizzou, and I'm also a member of the group uh, WeCanSolve.org. And uh, they both deal with you know, awareness of uh, sustainability and uh, the environment. And honestly, I'm going to ask you a question that deals with a global issue. Uh, what would you do to help promote environmental sustainability, and how would you address the global climate change? Do you want an answer from everyone, or is there a particular person oh, um, to whom you would? Senator Graham. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for uh, that. Uh, first of all, I'll be supporting the Clean Energy Initiative that is on the ballot uh, in November. Uh, that is uh, nearly identical to legislation uh, that I filed in the state senate uh, to increase the state's portfolio of green and renewable energies in this state which is almost identical to what we've done here in the city of Columbia. Uh, we have greatly expanded the types of uh, uh, energies uh, that we use here, uh, not depending as much on old energies, and uh, any sort of investment that we can start to make into wind, solar. Um, I think we need to start taking a look at nuclear again in Callaway too. I think there's a lot of things that we can do uh, to uh, try to improve uh, the environment, cut down on carbon emissions, and uh, I'll probably be supporting uh, your ballot initiative on November 4th. And, uh, go ahead. Thanks. First of all, as the only person up here who's actually litigated constitutional issues in the appellate courts of the state of Missouri, I've litigated over 80 of them, including two cases in the Missouri Supreme Court. So again, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the state of Missouri when I became a lawyer 15 years ago, and I will tell you that no one fights harder than lawyers to protect the Constitution of both the state of Missouri and of the United States. On that issue, under the doctrine of severability, had there been a provision in the statute that was unconstitutional, that provision would be cut, but the rest would not. We would still have the funding, but the research restrictions, had they been found unconstitutional, would be cut. We would still have the money. So again, to say that this is some matter of principle and that we had to cut the whole thing, simply is irrational. It's not reasonable. You don't negotiate that way. You can't pull a Pee Wee Herman when you go into an, a complicated negotiation and say, I'm not going to listen. You have to listen and take out those pieces that you, you know are solid, that you know you can go with, and you got to go with them. Mr. Schaefer, do you have a response? I do. Question? I support the, support the Sustainable Energy Initiative. And when we had a candidate's forum, uh, Senator Graham was not there. And they told me that he told them that had, if the energy uh, uh, lobbyists didn't support it, that it wouldn't get through. I'm glad to see that he now supports that. I, too, think that we need to support nuclear, we need to support more biomass, but here's the big issue, because this, will, this bill will come up in the next session. Amber Newey wants to pass a bill that allows them to collect from ratepayers money up front to build new plants. That's currently not allowed in the state of Missouri for several reasons. It affects low-income ratepayers. I am the only person at this table who has actually negotiated billions of dollars in rate issues with the city of Kansas City and MSD on these types of issues. You simply cannot ask low-income ratepayers to pay for money up front for private investor-owned utilities. I'd like to hear his opinion on that because he hasn't answered the Missourian for three weeks on that issue, according to the Missourian reporter. I oppose that, and I would like to hear his position on that. Anyone else like to respond? Then we'll move right along. Yes. My name is Garrett Bergquist. I have a uh, question really for all the candidates, and that is, where do you, all of you stand on Second Amendment rights? We'll just, I was going to say, we'll just pass the mic down. I own my granddad's gun. My husband owns three guns. We have them locked, unloaded, and a gun safe. I fully support responsible gun ownership. If you came to my home, you'd see my Winchester sign. We're Western antique collectors. 
Same answer, different guns. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. Colt 45. I don't have any guns and I don't want any guns. Second Amendment's fine, but... I do support gun ownership. Yeah, I supported. I uh, voted for the uh, Range Protection Act this year, uh, as well as uh, the uh, Castle Doctrine Bill. Um, my question is for Representative Rob. Um, in Senate Bill 389, uh, SUM worked in and worked with you very, very closely in trying to make sure that we get an increase of right flight scholarship. In 2011, uh, by Senate Bill 389, Subject to appropriation, uh, right by vote is due to receive an increase of $1,000 or $3,000 total, and then um, add a second tier, a <coughs> minor tier, if you will. Right. Um, how, what would you do if it reelected to make sure that that is included in the budget? Excuse me, could you hear the question in the back? The question is briefly that ASUM had worked with uh, Representative Rob on bright flight issues and specifically increasing bright flight. Is that a fair paraphrase? Yes. Um, you know, I was a sponsor of legislation the year before, I think, to double the amount of the bright flight stipend. So uh, it's difficult. The problem with bright flight is that it's not a need based scholarship. And so it's going to be given, it's going to play second fiddle, I think, until we get a level of funding for need-based scholarships to a level, I think, that most of the legislators and senators are comfortable with. But I'm a firm believer that we need to keep our brightest students in the state. Uh, you know, senator, was, it, was he a senator then? Or was he was representing Ken Jacob. Uh, actually was, as uh, Chris said, was the father of that. Uh, I think it's been a very, very good scholarship, especially uh, for the University of Missouri. We attract uh, far more than our fair share. Well, actually, there's no such thing as our fair share, because this, uh, this is the premier public institution in the state. And this is, if you're a bright flight student, this is where you want to go if you want to go to a public institution. So, well, I'll do everything I can to make sure that uh, we expand that funding as one of my top priorities. And the, the other one you know, along the same lines is I'm a very big supporter of increased funding for gifted education in this state. Uh, we did a very bad job in 2005 when we rewrote the formula, and uh, we need to uh, change that to the first opportunity we can to <coughs> actually have a gifted program, which obviously then sort of is the precursor to the Bright Flight Scholarship. Anyone else wish to come in? Yes. Yeah. Please speak loudly so that everyone can hear. Right. Um, my name is Evan Grohl. I represent a number of students on campus as well as your constituents as the president of the Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Um, I'd like to address all of you on an issue. Maybe we can do as much as the second amendment question kind of go down the line. Um, I would like to address you on the issue of drastically increasing incarceration rates of nonviolent offenders in the state of Missouri. Um, in Missouri, incarceration rates have doubled in the past 15 years, and the percentage of nonviolent offenders, especially drug offenders, is disproportionately rising as compared to violent offenders. Research has proven that incarceration is a non effective treatment for drug abuse. So, regardless of your stance on drug abuse or drug use, it has not been proven effective. Furthermore, the availability of illegal drugs and drug use as a whole has increased over all segments of the population. So what I want to ask you is, will you support alternatives to incarcerating violent, uh, non-violent drug offenders, and if so, how? Thank you. Having sat on the bench for two terms, I maybe have an um, insight into this. Look, nobody goes to jail for simple possession. It almost never happens. Here's what happens. Dingback gets elected, arrested for simple possession, <laughs> okay? Then Dingbat comes to court, and you give him a suspended sentence and fine him a little bit, and then Dingbat goes out and gets busted for DWI and beating up his girlfriend. And then he goes to jail for violating the probation. That's how Dingbat gets in jail. He doesn't go to jail behind simple possession of marijuana. 
It happens almost nowhere, almost never, that a person, especially a first-timer, goes to jail for marijuana and simple possession. Of course, there are instances where it does happen. But the rate at which it happens is virtually non-existent. No judge in Missouri has the space in his jail to put people in jail for simple possession. When Dingbat screws up later on, he goes to jail because he can't stay out of jail, and then the um, legalization advocates argue that Dingbat went to jail for possession. Only in the most hyper-technical way did that happen. Now, sales, sure. Happen, people go to jail behind sales. People go to jail for way too long, often, for sales. Um, whether or not marijuana or other drugs ought to be legalized is a different and complex question. But to believe that ordinary people are going to jail for simple possession is basically a fantasy. Uh, yeah, Representative Hobbs, I think one thing we've done that's been really, really effective as a state is our drug courts. And uh, they have been tremendously effective in uh, getting people off the drugs, changing their lifestyles, because so many times that is what it takes is a change in lifestyle. So I would like to see us increase our efforts with our drug courts. Any alternatives we can look at to keep from building prisons is a benefit. If we can get people back out and back to work and get their lives back together, then that is a good thing. Anyone else? I'll, I'll just chime in. We're very fortunate here in Boone County. The Boone County Bar for years has been very active in this area. We had some of the first drug courts, the first one of the first mental health courts. And I do support alternative options like that. Um, obviously, you know, the criteria has to be correct, and you have to have a, a judge who exercises sound discretion on, on who is likely to be a successful person in that program. Because it's not just do they fit, but I mean, really what the courts look at on those programs is, is this person likely to be successful and benefit from this program? But in the right cases, yes, I, I do support alternative um, forms of sentencing. Thank you, Joe. Mary Still, please. Uh, you're well, representing my district, so I just curious. We'll get to her, but Ms. Schultz asked me next. Absolutely. Several of us were at a NAMI forum, and you can check that out online. Part of what we're seeing is dual diagnosis. It is easier to treat a mental illness with an illegal substance on the street because it's cheaper, and it's easier to get a hold of than a doctor's prescription for many people. So I fully support our drug courts, and I'm very proud of them. I also think this is a symptom of our health care and our decreasing access to mental and physical health care. I also would argue that incarceration is not necessarily a bad thing. My foster daughter, who was reunified with, with her biological mother, her mother was incarcerated. It was the first time in her life since she was in high school that she had forced sobriety. She got a chance to review her life, and she told me that incarceration was the best thing that had ever happened to her. She got the treatment that she needed. I was proud to reunify her with her daughter, and I still am in contact with the family, and both of them are doing fantastic. Incarceration isn't always a negative thing, but we do need to take a look at what are the problems? What are we treating? If we treat mental health, we need to treat substance abuse. This is not a morality issue. This is increasing access to health care. I do support drug court. I think that is an appropriate way to handle this issue. I think uh, Columbia's laws, are, our city ordinances are good. Um, I don't think you treat addiction in prison. I don't know how you treat addiction, though. I think it's very hard to treat. So, um, you know, it's, it, the best we can do is start young and keep our kids healthy and move on from there. Senator Graham, did you signal that you want to speak? Um, no, I agree with that. Uh, Chris and the folks have talked about supporting the drug course. Uh, Judge Carpenter's done a great job uh, with the one that's here. And as resources uh, become available, I know that um, I and other members of the Judiciary Committee are very uh, interested in seeing what we can do to expand that. One of the other things we need to do in terms of uh, things uh, that need to be restored and the cuts that have been made is uh, a lot of the funds uh, for community uh, treatment and rehabilitation were cut. And so when people do want help, they don't have anywhere in the community to go get help, and that's where uh, oftentimes they end up uh, getting crossways with law enforcement, end up in the correctional system uh, instead of the health care system to get the help that they need. Yeah, 
Yes. Arrested is different than incarcerated. Actually, uh, down in the house, we actually, I did actually turn to my colleagues in the house uh, for medical. Uh, we've got Dr. Sam Page. We've got uh, actually three or four physicians in the house. So you can get treatment right on the floor of the House of Representatives. <laughs> I, I don't think that's true in the Senate, but it is true in the House. Unfortunately, we're losing at least two of those Bob Iger and Sam Page one way or the other. But, um, it, you know, when you talk, when it comes down to a philosophy on drugs, I mean, it's, you know, um, you simply have to make, I think, given the information that I have right now, I cannot support legalizing marijuana. I just can't do that. Now, I'm willing to, down the road, I think, look at this and look at the scientific evidence, uh, but at the current time, I'm just not capable of supporting it. And I had lots of discussions with a very famous attorney here in town on this issue. Uh, that bill has been presented to me every single year, and I have uh, decided I'm not going to be the sponsor of that legislation. That's all, about, all there is to it. Uh, look, I'm going to vote for uh, legalization of medical marijuana, but it is not a clean issue. It is a very very interesting gray issue about whether medical marijuana is actually better or not. Uh, there are good arguments on both sides of this. This is something about which reasonable people can very reasonably disagree. Yes. Um, I was told yesterday by a teacher America representative that um, the way that we project our future prison populations is by looking at test scores of third grade African American males. And uh, my question is directed at Kelly Schultz. And uh, I was wondering what kind of programs um, you would support to help ensure that we're not um, essentially like losing children between the cracks and things like that. And um, what experience you have on the issue that you'll bring? Absolutely. Well, the experience I bring to the table, as I mentioned, I am a foster parent. I have had nine children in my home. My specialty is runaway teenage males, drug positive. And that sounds like a strange specialty, but when you become a foster parent, you fill out a form and you talk about what type of behavior you can handle in your home. I worked at a crisis center for children and I can see the most impact in our teenage males that are at risk. Absolutely predictors of success in education. I, my 19 year old was the very first in his family. His brothers, his parents, none of them had graduated from high school. He is the first individual in his family to age into adulthood outside of a correctional facility. What that took was a lot of hard work. It took keeping him in school, a football program, to keep him going to school because he got to play and keep his grades up. So I absolutely support athletic programs, but also took alternative <coughs> education. He was involved in a program here at the University of Missouri where he actually earned school credit to come here and work at the hospital in landscaping. This young man was not going to attend the University of Missouri. He needed to have a job skill that when he graduated from high school, he could use and he could get hired. We need to take a look at our education system as a whole and make sure that we are meeting each individual student's need. Differentiated education cannot take place when you have a teacher with more than 27 students. Some are gifted, some have special needs, Everybody has a different learning style. So we need more teachers in the classroom that are trained in differentiated education and meeting gifted students' needs, special students' needs, and preparing them for the job market. Would anyone else like to comment? Okay. We have a question at the back of the room. Yes, ma'am, thank you. My name is Josh Travis. I'm a freshman here at the University of Missouri. I'm so proud to be here. I've wanted to come here since fifth grade um, and was blessed enough to 
piece together enough private scholarships in order to fund my education here. Um, I'm a political science and history major, and it's been very interesting to see uh, many uh, dives into history. But one reason why I study is political science is because even when we talk about history and what's happened in the past, people still face issues. And I want to bring something to you that's often overlooked. For the past year, I've had the honor of serving the state as a commission, the Missouri Community Service Commission. I was appointed by Governor Blunt in June 2007, approved by the Senate in August 2007. So, Senator Graham, thank you very much. Um, and so I want to bring to you the issue of volunteerism. Uh, the Community Service Commission, we strive in administering and managing our AmeriCorps programs here in the state. I'm promoting volunteerism in the state. My question for, for everybody on the panel is what role do you think that the state government should play or should um, further increase in, in, in increasing volunteer levels in the state and addressing problems that government simply can't? Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments, and I'm glad to hear uh, about your service. Uh, you know, I think government's biggest role they can play in trying to help volunteerism is to stay out of folks' way. Too many times government puts uh, constraints on what private entities and individuals can do, and government should be there to encourage, to uh, make access available, but basically, they should stay out of folks' way and let them try and help people in the best way they can. So I congratulate you for your efforts. And uh, uh, sometime, come over to Mexico and we'll show the Next Steps program that we run uh, where we're teaching uh, kids, tutoring them after school. You, you really enjoy it. My answer differs just a little bit. We can create scholarships that, based on GPA, service in high school and need and certainly encourage that vol volunteerism and community feeling a part of your community and making a difference we can certainly do that at the state level and we do do that at the state level we can also make it easier to form partnerships between state agencies that are providing services and private nonprofit organizations as well we can work with the university and work with credit system, and we do that right now as well. So there are many opportunities, whether it's the actual state or quasi-state at the University of Missouri, to promote volunteerism. Anyone else wish to respond? Senator Graham? First of all, thank you for uh, your leadership on the commission. Um, you know, one of the things I think we also need to take a look at, uh, not just in the state, but what's going on nationally. Uh, I think uh, what Senator Obama is, uh, promoting in terms of young people uh, get volunteering or getting involved in community service, whether it's in a veteran's home, or whether it's in the Peace Corps, whether it's in the military, uh, making sure that in exchange for that service, uh, we can provide you with higher education is one of the greatest investments that we can make. If you take a look at where economic development happens, uh, it's not by handing out hundreds of millions of dollars of tax credits trying to get French Canadian companies to move here. It's by investing in higher education because a, an educated workforce is where the jobs of the 21st century are going to be. And if you take a look in this state and throughout this country, where job growth occurs, it clusters around areas of higher education. That's why Boone County usually is in the top 10 of unemployment in the nation. Not Wake County, where Northwest Missouri State is, is usually number one in unemployment in the nation. So the more that we're able to invest in you and your education and keep you in our communities, we're going to grow the jobs of the 21st century, and that's the best thing we can do uh, to make uh, not just our state a better place, but our nation a better place. Thank you. Uh, the A-plus program, I think, as everybody knows, uh, requires uh, a certain number of community service hours in order to, uh, to qualify for that program. But I have a real problem with government getting involved at all with anything to do with volunteers, because once you provide a subsidy of any kind, you no longer have a volunteer, do you? If I provide a subsidy to you to do something, in one form or another, in essence I am underwriting some portion of cost that you are going to incur, and you're no longer volunteering for that particular uh, activity, whatever it is. People who volunteer, volunteer because it makes them feel good, and it, makes, it gives them a sense of involvement in the community or involvement in a particular activity and as to what way we should lead. 
I think that promoting the values that, that lead to volunteerism, I mean, they start at home. And I, I'd ask you, and we can talk about it afterwards, but what is in your life up to this point that instilled in you the ability to want to volunteer and do something that you weren't really even getting anything in return for? I have three small kids, and we talk about community activity and volunteering every single day. And I'll tell you some of the ways that we work on it. I mean, I have a, we have a 19-inch color TV that we got as a wedding present 18 years ago. You know, that's the kind of things you do. You, you teach your kids what's right and what's wrong, and you take away all of the static and all the things that compete for their time and their interests, and you instill in them the value of community service, the importance of volunteering in and of itself without getting anything in return for that. That's how we deal with it in our family, and, and I think that's what truly leads to people who are selfless and they're volunteering. So, anybody else? We have one quick question, but we don't have time to give everyone an answer. We'll allow, yes, is it for one person? Or? Question because we only have five yeah, minutes left. I, I, um, I just wanted to actually rephrase the answer to the question in the first place. Yes, for 